Guys, this is Phil Galfon for BlueFirePoker.com, and today I am going to be making a philosophy episode four, um, entitled "Uh Oh, He Four Bet Me," uh, and he probably has a good hand. This is inspired by uh, the video I made a few weeks ago. Um, it was a five ten no limit video uh, across a few tables, and I had a lot of questions from you guys about. Uh, both this hand, or the spot in general, uh, and another spot that I talked about, uh, which was uh, check raising more turns um, and how to balance it and such. Um, I think both of them are interesting spots. I think the uh, the check raise turn spot is actually um, very very interesting, interesting, and would take uh, actually a much more um, I don't know comprehensive uh, video. And actually, this this video itself uh, took uh, quite a long time to prepare, um, and should should take quite a, quite a while to get through. Um, so in this hand, um, we hadn't been playing too long. We were raised to 26 by the under the gun player. I decided to three bet in position with my ace eight suited to 93, and he four bets us to 208. Um, in the actual hand, I elected to call. Um, I mean, if you're super interested, you can go back and look at the uh, the video a few weeks ago. Um, I ended up uh, losing the hand after bluffing off, I don't know, like a third of the rest of my stack. Um, but that's not all that relevant. Uh, I got a lot of questions about, you know, going more in depth on discussing calling these four bets uh, in these spots where you're given, you know, great pot odds, you have position. Uh, but your opponent very likely has uh, a very strong range. Um, so I want to go into our start to dive into the math. Uh, basically, we need to call 115. There's already 316 in the pot. Um, so basically, we have about 2.7 to 1 odds, which means we need about 26.7% equity to break even if the hand were to end right now. So if this was an all-in shove, um, we would need 26.7% equity to break even. Obviously, there's a lot more to consider than that, uh, and I'll get into it. But for the sake of, I don't know, just learning some information, um, against the pretty much tightest of ranges that he could have, uh, the top range, uh, ace-king suited, ace-king offsuit, and tens plus, um, we have almost 30% equity. If we throw in uh, just a few um, low suited connector bluffs, um, we're actually all the way up to 36.5% equity. Um, probably would be more than that. Uh, in the actual hand, he was 4-bet uh, bluffing with uh, uh, offsuit. I forget the exact hand, but offsuit broadways. And um, if we throw in those, uh, and a few combos of those, it actually would change the numbers quite a bit. But um, obviously we can see that if the play ended right now, after uh, preflop, we do have enough of an advantage to call. Um, obviously there's a lot more to consider than that. So, um, postflop, it's kind of hard to uh, quantify, but for this call to be unprofitable, uh, since we do have a profitable call in a vacuum preflop um, if the hand were to end. It means that we must be at a postflop disadvantage. Um, I mean, that's pretty obvious, I would think, but I do like to put it in obvious terms. Uh, I want to point out, I, I meant to point this out earlier, but this video is, uh, unlike some of my other videos, not going to be so much a uh, instructional video uh, as far as, you know, me playing certain ways, explaining why I'm playing, uh, me telling you that, that a play is correct, or uh, and then all the reasons I believe it's correct. This is kind of more of a, a theory or an argument, and uh, what I'm going to do is provide arguments for um, and, you know, some against uh, making this preflop call and making it with some other hands. And I'm not to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure of the correct play, and I think it's it's a spot that is not analyzed very well or very often, um, at least uh, anywhere that I've heard of. And so I want to kind of get the ball rolling uh, in the 
poker community to see if we can figure out um, whether or not we can be making these calls. And this, uh, like I said, will be, you know, just some arguments and some things to think about, um, but definitely not any kind of definitive proof one way or the other. And um, I guess, yeah, we'll take it from there. And so I'm personally not, not sure of the correct play. Uh, I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other. I just want to get you guys thinking about, uh, and myself thinking about, uh, the things we need to consider. Um, so, uh, like I said, we must be at a post flop disadvantage for this to be unprofitable, so we have to figure out, you know, whether or not that's true. Uh, and here I say, I believe that we are not at a post flop disadvantage against uh, some average to weak opponents. In addition to that, I believe that with a hand like 7-5 suited, we may actually be an, at an advantage. Um, I think 7-5 suited in this spot is actually a little bit better than ace-8 suited. Not a ton better, um, but a little bit better. And I will get into that. Um, and then I have, you know, in parentheses, until they learn our range, uh, at which point it could work well for our, over our overall game, but that gets uh, a lot more complex. Um, and by that I mean um, part of 7-5 suited and ace-8 suited. Um, at least initially, we're going to have some, some post-flop deception, uh, just given that they think our range is a lot stronger than it actually is. They don't think we can have a hand this week in our range, and so uh, we are going to be able to presumably presumably bluff some of the some of the boards that don't hit our hand. Um, so I guess let's get into it. Post flop here is very tough to analyze. Um, the tools aren't out there for us to say at least as far as I know, for us to say, okay, we have ace-eight suited, he has this range, there's this much money in the pot, um, and stacks are as such, uh, we have position, who has the advantage post-flop, meaning, you know, across all possible flop turns and rivers, uh, assuming we're both playing pretty well, uh, who's going to come out ahead? Uh, I think it's no limit in this situation, uh, even specifically, are far too complex for that, at least uh, as far as I know, uh, in terms of, you know, software, uh, analytical software technology. Um, so I just want to give us some things to think about that may, uh, you know, start to help us lean in one direction or the other on who has a post-flop advantage. Um, the obvious con to our hand, his advantage is that he has a, a stronger range than our particular hand. We have a state suited in this case. Um, Obviously, whatever his range is to be raising another gun for betting uh, is going to be ahead of ace-eight suited, which, um, even though we've accounted for the preflop equity edge he has, since we have more than enough pot odds to be calling preflop, um, he's going to have an, an equity edge on most flops. Uh, so that is certainly uh, a strong advantage in his favor. Um, the pros, or our advantages, first of all, position. Um, an obvious one, but not as strong as it usually is just because the stack to pot ratio right now stacks are not all that deep in comparison to the pot size. The pot's already inflated. Uh, however, um, I guess I'll skip to my third point. Uh, when I say good future pot odds and stack size situations, we, if we want, are going to always be able to see the turn, pretty much always, and often or occasionally see the river. Uh, you know, if we have, let's say, 750 in stacks or whatever it is, and 400 in the pot, um, he's going to be betting, you know, in the smaller, um, he's going to be betting something smaller, like, you know, 200 or less, uh, at least most of my opponents, um, and I think it's correct to do so, but what that means is we're going to have great pot odds on the flop, um, we have the option to call, take a card off and see what he does on the turn out of position. Um, we're also in a good situation to shove the flop um, if we want to semi-bluff, um, just because, you know, he bets, I mean, I'm using my made-up stack sizes, but they're about right. He bets uh, 200 into 400 um, with another, what's that, 550 behind, and we jam, uh, and it puts him in a pretty tough spot with some of the weaker hands in his range on those boards. Um, and then the second point, which I kind of skipped over, is that we have a disguised range. Yes, um, we don't necessarily know his range, but I think that our range is going to look fairly strong here. 
Um, we can obviously have some slow played ace ace king king type hands. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, it's very tough for him to put us on a hand. We can have, like, I mean, pretty much anything suited, I would say. Uh, that's somewhat well connected. If he knows we're calling with those hands, if he doesn't know that we're calling with those hands and he thinks uh, we'd be folding hands like ace-eight suited, 9-8 um, suited, then he has to actually put us on an ace-ace, king-king type hand, uh, pretty much, because I don't know what else we'd be raised calling with. Um, if that's the case, uh, obviously we have a huge post-flop advantage, or a very large post-flop advantage, if he puts us on, you know, ace-ace or king-king, uh, you know, the majority of the time, and we know this, uh, he's going to be check-folding most flops um, to a very small bet. Um, I mean, obviously that's all, it's tough to know what he thinks your range is, but um, I guess, again, just just some things to think about. Uh, I know it's very inexact. Um, speaking of which, I want to talk about um, in the rest of this video, I'm going to assume that his range is ace-king and 10-10+, plus, uh, for the sake of simplicity. I analyzed like a few different equity situations, uh, a few different flops and uh, flop textures and, and what they mean to us in our hand, and they become much more easy to analyze uh, if we give him like a tight exact range like this. Um, if we change this to ace-ace, uh, sorry, 10-10 plus and ace-king, uh, and then add like that he could be bluffing 20% of the time with any hand in his opening range that's folding to a 3-bet, um, it just becomes at least with with all the tools that I know about uh, pretty much impossible to analyze and uh, I know that the fact that I'm simplifying this is going to make it less exact uh, and even further from, you know, actual play. But I think it's still an interesting exercise in, you know, thinking about poker and a situation that people don't often analyze. Um, and, you know, it's not completely useless. We can, we can take this analysis um, and think about what, what a bluffing range uh, would do to it. And so the implications here, um, adding bluffs to his range should improve our chances overall, um, but we'd have to play different post-flop uh, in a few different scenarios. And hopefully you guys can figure out why after after I go through the examples and, and we can all talk about how. Um, I have a feeling that this is a video that, especially since it leaves so many questions, you know, barely answered or unanswered, um, there'll be a lot more questions to follow. Hopefully we can get a forum discussion going um, and get deeper into that. Maybe um, I could get deeper into it in a in another video, but uh, this this analysis itself took a long time. And um, yeah, like I said, it's going to be much more complex to analyze uh, when he has uh, some bluffs in his range, but that doesn't mean less profitable. It just means we'd have to play a little bit differently and actually... Um, if we add some bluffs into his preflop range, it improves our preflop equity edge, um, which means that our postflop edge has to be even less. Uh, it improves our postflop equity edge against his range. Um, I mean, that's really the same as saying our preflop equity edge, but what I mean by that is that, you know, on more flops, we will have enough equity c to continue against his range. Um, we'll also... Um, or I guess that's all I mean. <laughs> uh, that we'll have uh, more equity post-flop as well as pre-flop against his range. So that does work in our favor. Um, but he has a little more deception working in his favor. So one common argument against um, calling these three bets, um, especially with a hand like ace-8 suited, is that uh, it's so often dominated. And even though we have our pre-flop equity, um, as near 30%, even against his tightest range, um, that flops won't work too well for us. There are very few flops that work well for us. Um, so I want to look, take a look at a few flops in terms of equity against his range and, um, you know, what we can do about it. Um, so here you see the first flop I have is a ace five three rainbow, basically uh, a flop where we flop top pair um, and have to worry about him having ace king or ace ace himself. Um, as you can see, we're going to be good, uh, or sorry, we have 
70.5% equity. That doesn't mean we're going to be good right now 70.5% of the time. Um, but what it does mean is on an ace high flop like this, we can actually be very, very confident. Um, we do have to worry about how the hand plays out. Obviously, um, his actions change his range, and, and we'll have to play poker from there. Um, but I'm just looking kind of at the basic situations. However, when we change the flop to uh, ace-10-3, uh, our equity goes down to actually 59%. Uh, this is due to the fact that he can have uh, pocket tens in his range now. Uh, on the first flop, he can't flop a set. Um, and if you move the flop around, uh, mess around with it, uh, ace-jack-3, ace-queen-3, and ace-king-3 uh, are pretty much the same. Uh, in terms of equity. They're all the same except ace uh, king 3 is a little bit different because you can have ace king and that kills our equity or our two pair outs but it actually makes those hands uh, a little bit less uh, probable uh, the ace king and the king king. But uh, anyways it's about this uh, for all those flops. Um, when we flop uh, a pair with our 8 um, for instance here on uh, jack 8 3 board um, we still have 42 percent equity now, what does that mean for us in terms of how we play it? Um, I mean, it depends. It uh, depends on your opponent. It depends on how much he bets, um, what he thinks of you and your range, things like that. Um, but here I'm just kind of, I don't know, compiling facts um, for you guys to think about and not necessarily trying to prove anything to you or tell you that you should be playing a certain way. Um, here on the bottom flop, 763, uh, surprisingly, um, I assume to most of you, we still have decent equity, 20.5%. And what this means is um, if he were to bet something on the smaller end of things, we could consider um, uh, like kind of a loose float. Um, and against certain opponents, if, if they do have a large bluffing frequency in their 4-bet range, uh, especially if it consists of uh, unsuited Broadway hands like uh, or suited Broadway hands, you know, king-queen, king-jack, uh, queen-jack suited, things like that, uh, this is actually a great board to shove on if he bets something like 200. I didn't run the exact math, but I'd assume if he bets 200 and 400 with 550 behind, uh, you have a profitable shove. Uh, if he has enough of those um, four bit bluffs in his range, um, especially if they don't contain i mean they pretty they are pretty unlikely to contain uh seven or six or like pocket sevens pocket sixes pocket threes um, so it's just something to think about. This is a graph that I got from uh pro poker tools, and I looked at uh ace eight suited against his range. Um, and it's a cool tool, and what it does is tell you what equity you're going to have on, you know, certain percentages of flops. Uh, the important points here, I think, uh, if you look at the two points I highlighted first uh, at the top left, um, it's going to be about, looks like 13% of the time, we're going to have a lot of equity, 85% um, or more. So it'll actually be a significant favorite, you know, more often than you would think. Um, and because he has a tight range, um, we actually, you know, have an okay chance of getting his money. Uh, I say okay because uh, oftentimes, I guess if when we flop like an ace with a flush draw, um, something like that. I guess if we go back and we look at um, ace five three, um, that's in a seventy percent range. So we're looking at scenarios here where we have a lot more equity than that. So I'm thinking uh, ace with a flush draw. Um, any kind of flush draw, maybe. Uh, no, that doesn't give us good equity. Pair with a flush draw, I guess flushes. Um, pair plus straight draw. Anyways, um, you know, some of those times we're going to have an ace uh, on the flop, and we may lose some action from kings, queens, jacks, or tens. Um, but um, it's still, you know, important to note that 13% of the time or so we're going to have very significant equity. Um, equity. Around 18% of the time, we're going to have 50% equity. Um, and then there, I mean, about half the time, we're going to have 20% equity or more. Um, and those are kind of the scenarios, like I mentioned earlier here on the bottom, um, on a 6 
seven three flop um, where we may actually be able to float some flops um, potentially bluff some turns improve on turns um, things like that potentially check back see a river see if we improve uh, take that opportunity to bluff um, I guess the point is that we actually have more of a hand than you would think more often than you would think um, So just some more to think about. And from there, I want to look at a little bit of math. And uh, I had to do this math by hand myself. Or not really myself. Uh, I took these numbers. I actually forget from where. Um, and then had to mess around with the ace-king number um, with the help of uh, Don Wynn. And then uh, total them up myself. So if I did make an error, I apologize. It seems about right to me. Um, Basically, what this means is, with each hand, how often will they flop a hand worse than top pair? Um, obviously, aces will never flop worse than top pair. Uh, there are the percentages for kings, queens, jacks, tens, and ace-king. Also, uh, note that we hold ace-eight, which means um, it's more likely that ace-king will flop, um, or less likely that it'll flop top pair. Um, actually, this would affect the numbers a little bit more than I accounted for because the uh, the pair numbers um, were given to me and I didn't do the calculations myself. Um, so this might work in his favor very sli a very slight amount. But anyways, um, with his range, he's going to flop top pair um, or better uh, about half the time. And the other half the time, he's going to have either no pair with his ace-king or he's going to have... Um, an underpair to the board. And that I think uh, hopefully should surprise some of you in terms of, you know, how easy of a position he will be in. Obviously, when he flops an overpair, it's pretty unlikely he's going to get away from his hand. But uh, here we see that almost half the time um, he's going to flop worse than an overpair, worse than top pair, and have to proceed with caution, have to maybe give us an opportunity to. Uh, see turns and rivers, um, show us some weakness, uh, see if we can take the pot away, things like that. So, um, just another thing to think about. And because of that, um, or because of, because of the fact that, uh, you know, when an ace flops and uh, he has an underpair, that's going to coincide with the times that we flop top pair with our hand like ace eight. I actually prefer a hand, uh, as I said earlier, like seven five suited. Uh, in this scenario, and the reason is that um, the times that they have, let's say, queens and an ace flops, uh, that's a great opportunity for us to, us to bluff. However, when we have ace eight suited, we don't have to bluff. We have the best hand, um, and so kind of our uh, value in terms of bluffable flops and our value in terms of flops that improve us to the best hand kind of overlap. Whereas with a hand like 7-5 suited, um, a lot of the flops that hurt uh, their range and uh, and usually they'll be able to um, or will be able to learn a little bit from them being in position and um, you know hopefully be able to figure out when it improves uh, or sorry, uh, hurts their range. Um, that doesn't overlap with the times that our hand's going to improve just, you know, based on the merits of the hand and flop like a strong draw or two pair type hand trips uh, or a pair and, you know, potentially uh, be able to continue things like that. Um, so I want to talk about having 7-5 suited uh, and things that we can do with it rather than uh, the ace-eight suited I had in the actual hand. So here are a couple of the more common uh, flop scenarios we could encounter, or at least common ways that we can improve our hand on the flop. Uh, it's a little bit different with 5-7 seven, seven suited than with ace-8 suited. It's pretty tough for us to flop a hand that um, has great equity. Um, I mean, sometimes we'll flop trips, sometimes we'll flop two pairs, sometimes we'll flop flushes or straights, um, or, you know, pair plus draw, things like that. But most of the time we improve is going to be with a pair, like here at the top on a jack-7-3. We actually have 42% equity. Um, definitely enough to 
um, you know, continue with the hand against a small bet and reevaluate later. Um, and on the bottom here with just the gut shot and backdoor draw, we have about 29% equity. Um, also enough if, you know, he is an opponent who is going to turn his hand face up on a later street, um, and he's also, um, you know, likely to give up on a bluff, uh, and betting small on the flop, uh, this is a flop we can likely continue on. Um, and then I'll show you the same graph from Pro Poker Tools. Um, this one's a little bit different. It's much less likely, as I said, that we flop a hand with a ton of equity. Um, we're looking at about 11 or 12 percent that we flop 70 percent equity. Um, about looks like 16 percent that we have 50 percent equity. But in the uh, 20 to 30 percent range, it goes a little bit further. Um, we have about 20 percent equity, almost 60 percent of the time, 20 percent or greater. Um, and I know that doesn't seem like much, but I want to actually get into a couple of post-flop scenarios. And I know up to this point, you know, I haven't talked about how we were going to be playing our hands. Um, because, you know, first of all, there are way too many flops that can occur. Um, and opponents we can be up against and bet sizes we can be up against. But I do want to just give you a couple of examples and some things to think about just so... Uh, you realize that we don't just need to flop a hand uh, in order to win. So uh, I have up here the total average um, with his range. The times that he flops less than top pairs, about 49%. Um, I believe I did that calculation correctly, and that's um, accounting for the fact that we have the 7-5 suited uh, instead of the ace-8 suited. So he has some more combos of uh, ace-ace, and he has some more combos of ace-king, uh, and there are more aces available to flop. Um, and then I want to look at these two specific flops from there. Um, the 49% is just a reminder, and a reminder that, you know, about half the time he's going to flop a hand that's vulnerable and that he's not happy with. Keep in mind that we have a very strong range, uh, perceived range, or we should most of the time, uh, so he will definitely proceed with caution about half the time. And, um, like I said, I want to take a look at these two flops. Um, on flop of Ace-8 Deuce, Rainbow, he is going to flop an under pair 61.5% of the time. Um, and then here we are on a flop of queen 8, 3 rainbow. 37% of the time he's going to have ace king unpaired. And 28% of the time he is going to have uh, an under pair, uh, jacks or tens. So these two boards that actually seem pretty good for his range, um, when you look at the percentages, uh, actually aren't all that good. Um, and these are some boards that you potentially could be attacking. Um, so here we have the 7-5 suited on queen 8 3 and I have those uh, numbers up there just as a reminder uh, no pair 37% under pair 28% which means that he has worse than top pair on this board 65% of the time um, in this scenario I'm gonna say we have 400 in the pot and 750 in stacks and he's gonna see bet into us after four betting uh, $175 if we raise here to 375 the break-even point um, for that play to uh, break even, he needs to fold 39.5% of the time, which would mean that, uh, let's say, you know, he folds most of the time that he has ace-king unpaired, and, you know, just a small percentage of the time he has uh, jacks or tens, although, in actuality, he should be doing uh, the opposite of that. He should be more likely to uh, to continue with the unpaired ace-king than with under pairs. So let's say he folds all of his under pairs, uh, 28%. To get that last, uh, just about 10%, he would have to fold just over a quarter of the time he has ace king to make this profitable or break even play um, against somebody you know that perceives us to have a very strong range here. Um, we're going to be making a lot of money on this because uh, he'll probably be folding somewhere near 50, 60% of the time. Um, if he's super tight, maybe 65% of the time um, because. He doesn't have top pair better, and it's a four bet pot. We call it a four bet um, with a perceived strong range. Um, so this is a spot where, you know, most people, if they called the four bet, which I think they wouldn't, um, would likely just fold this flop to a C bet uh, when it's actually a, a very good flop in some ways. Um, 
for not for our hand or our range maybe for our range but more a bad flop for his range and one that we can take advantage of and you know like I said earlier the fact that our opponents are going to be c-betting small gives us some ability to maneuver and uh, to make a raise like this of 375 to win 575 giving us you know some good pot odds on our bluffs um, the next example here, uh, the flop of ace, eight, deuce. Um, he's going to have an under pair, uh, tens through kings, 61.5% of the time. Uh, if the same action is taken, he would only have to fold, again, 39.5% of the time to make it a profitable play. Um, do I think he would fold about 40% of the time when he has an under pair 60% of the time, which means... He has to fold two-thirds of the time that he has a hand like queen-queen here. I don't know, um, but more importantly, uh, you know, oftentimes he's going to be checking this board. You need to know your opponent. You need to know if uh, he often uh, c-bets all of his hands in a four-bet pot, um, which is something that I'm actually somewhat a proponent of uh, against people that, you know, haven't done all this analysis. I think oftentimes uh, just the easiest way to play um, is to just c-bet. Uh, on the smaller side with your queens and take it from there. Um, however, you know, if this changes the way people are playing these spots, um, then the C better, myself as a C better, should change the way that I approach it. Um, so sometimes he checks, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, that could tell you that his range is maybe more like 80 to 90% um, under pairs, in my opinion. I think maybe he'll check. Uh, top set, and then very rarely ace king, and then all his under pairs, um, or most of his under pairs. Um, so just you know, some quick head math, um, just quick guess that uh, he would have under pairs near 90, or maybe even over 90 percent of the time in that case. Um, which means you know you could take a free card, or you could just start bluffing right here and uh, try to get him to fold by the river. Um, you could even make like a larger bet, something like. I don't know, 225, which um, will set you up, oh, not even that large, actually, 175 does it pretty well, or 200, um, but sets you up for a turn shove on any spade, any six, um, potentially even a nine if you think you have enough fold equity, or you could just take your free card, um, but we do have, you know, a considerable, a considerable amount of backdoor draws here with this hand, um, I've talked about spots like this before, but we pretty much have 10 spade outs and then another 3 6 outs. Um, so that's 13 outs to turn, um, an 8 or 9 out draw. Um, and then the last point here that's pretty important, um, not in terms of the analysis we were doing, but um, one way to uh, adjust your game if he's 4-bet bluffing. If your opponent's 4-bet bluffing but not as much with the ace-x hands, let's say he maybe calls your 3-bet with ace-queen and... Um, isn't too like isn't raising under the gun with ace ten maybe ace jack suited but he's calling with that um, but let's say you know pretty rarely four bet bluffing with an ace jack or ace ten type hand um, but he is four bet bluffing with his um, you know king queen king jack queen jack suited type hands this flop becomes insanely profitable to bluff because um, all of his or most of his four bet bluff range missed this flop as well so he's now going to have an under pair or air, um, you know, much more than 61% of the time, maybe closer to 80% of the time, depending on his um, bluffing frequency preflop. Um, and then he's certainly going to fold this often enough uh, after c betting. Another thing to think about uh, in that case is that um, if he starts checking his under pairs, um, then his c betting range becomes much more polarized. Um, and you can actually consider like floating um, since it's a cheaper play because then his, his c-betting range is maybe aces, maybe ace-king and then uh, his like king-jack, queen-jack type hands um, just opens you up to more possibilities and things to think about there are obviously um, a lot more flops <laughs> than just the two that I analyzed just now where um, they're going to flop pretty poor or worse than top pair um, with a large percentage of their range um, and you know there are obviously flops that they're going to flop very well on and will just fold to a c-bet um, but uh, that's something that 
all of us can do on our own time, uh, checking those flops and seeing which ones we can continue on, which ones we can't. Um, and obviously, as I said earlier, uh, we simplified this to just be uh, including the times that they have ace, king, and tens plus. Um, when you add some bluffs, uh, depending on what they are, that certainly changes the specific flops that are good for us um, and the ones that are bad for us. And sometimes, as we saw in the, in the previous examples, it changes how good or bad uh, those flops are for us. Um, so in conclusion, um, obviously we're making money on our preflop call even if they have the tightest of ranges. So the question is, are we making money or losing little enough in all post-flop situations combined to make this call profitable? Did I give you a definitive answer? Absolutely not. Um, I don't have a definitive answer. Um, but as I said earlier, I'd really like to get everyone thinking about this spot. Um, you know, first of all, it makes you a tougher player. Um, if you are reacting, uh, or sorry, you know, folding to less four bets, I should say. Um, another important thing is that all of this analysis um, is pretty useful and, and becomes a lot more relevant as stacks get deeper. We uh, analyze this with 100 big blind stacks, but um, most of the math is still the same with 200 big blind stacks, except now we actually have position that matters a whole lot. Um, and, you know, the more defined their hand range is, the better for us. Um, in that, you know, the more money we have behind when we know their hand range, um, and have it narrowed down quite a bit, uh, the more post-flop edge we gain. I think that if all this analysis was done um, with 200 big blind stacks, um, but we know their preflop hand range is 10s plus and ace king, um, I think we have a very, very profitable call preflop and are in a hugely profitable post-flop situation um, just because of how much pressure we can put on them on the flops that don't connect well with their hand range, um, how much they have to tell us about their hand, um, across multiple streets, um, I mean, for obvious reasons, really. So as as games get deeper, and I, I predict that in the future of No Limit, um, 100 Big Blind Poker is going to be um, close enough to solved. Um, obviously, it's going to be far from solved, but close enough to solved by the best players that there's not going to be a ton of edge in the games, and I think people are going to move towards 200. Um, big blinds and, and greater uh, in terms of uh, what they're going to play regularly, and I guess they uh, I'm not super in touch with the No Limit games right now, but um, I understand that it is getting, uh, or deeper deeper games are becoming more popular um, so as far as figuring out um, are we making money post-flop uh, in all these situations I didn't give you an answer, but I gave you some things to think about, um, so here's some things to consider um our equity isn't as terrible on many flops with both uh, ace-eight suited and seven-five suited as as you may have thought it was. Um, more importantly, your opponent's going to flop worse than top pair about half the time, um, and uh, many flops are conducive to floating or bluff raising and using uh, some pretty simple hand combo analysis that I used. Um, we can figure out which these flops are. I obviously I didn't go into it uh, just because. It, I thought it would get a little bit too boring, but essentially if we have, let's say, 7-5 suited, um, he has 16 combinations of ace-king, and then 6 combinations of every other pocket pair, so, um, and then, you know, you remove the cards, uh, if an ace flops or a queen flops, um, it obviously changes the hand combinations a bit, but um, you could take it from there and figure out, you know, which flops, like I did, the ace-eight-deuce and the queen-eight-deuce, or queen-eight-three, or whatever flops, are ones where he's going to be flopping uh, worse than top pair um, very, very often, over 60% of the time. Um, so you can look at other flops and figure out which ones work well for you. Um, position still matters. Um, you know, a lot of people think that once you get a third of your stack in, or I guess less than that, a fourth of your stack in pre-flop, um, I guess with a third of your stack in, it really doesn't matter that much. But with a fourth or, you know, 20% of your stack in preflop, uh, position still does matter. And as you can see, or as I showed you, we can get to turns and rivers and uh, 
use our hand reading skills and the fact that he has to act first uh, in our favor. Uh, also, our range is disguised and somewhat intimidating. Um, some opponents might believe that when we call this format, we only have premium hands. Some might believe we have premium hands and some semi-speculative high card hands. Um, and then maybe they know we have some hands like the ones that we're considering defending here. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about, which I didn't address, is implied odds. Um, especially with a hand like 7-5 suited, uh, when he has these like super premiums and you know often has an overpair on many flops and you flop two pair, you flop trips, um, you're going to get his whole stack always. And uh, that's something you know to consider. It's, it's somewhat relevant. It doesn't happen super often, but when it does, it pays off uh, in a really big way. Um, so that's something we should factor into our analysis. And, um, you know, uh, obviously I haven't given you guys a definitive answer, and I'm not going to because I don't have one. But uh, I think it's important and pretty fun to look at these spots that people aren't looking at and to figure out or try to figure out um, some new plays that, that people aren't making. And I think that, you know, that is where you get your edge in poker, even if you don't end up figuring anything out that's useful. That attitude and um, the practice of going through hand combinations, going through new spots and thinking about them creatively is, is what's going to separate you from your opponents and give you the ability to think quicker on the fly and just a better grasp on, you know, the huge multitude of situations that you could find yourself in in uh, No Limit Hold'em. Uh, as well as PLO, obviously, although it gets uh, much tougher to analyze. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. I assume there'll be a lot of questions, and I may not have your answers, so I definitely encourage you guys to ask and hopefully um, help out, answer each other's questions, um, work with me to answer these questions, maybe start a forum uh, thread and uh, see what we can figure out. Um, thanks for watching. This has been Phil Galfon from BlueFirePoker.com. Take care.